Uh, this event, uh, this evening, is part of a cycle of events on generating respect for the law. It's actually the, the 12 events of the cycle. We've had a series of events in, in Geneva and in different locations on different humanitarian problems. We had the issue of uh, torture. We had an event on the issue of sexual violence. We had a series of events always exploring uh, humanitarian problems and how to address them, how to make the law respected. So we're very happy to, to have you this evening. We're also recording this event. Um, and uh, it's also the opportunity this evening to launch the second part of an exhibition we have on the same topic, Generating Respect for the Law. So we uh, explored the, the past efforts by the ICRC to uh, generate respect for the law. We started in the 19th century and with this new ex exhibition, we, we are now exploring the period between 1950 until the end of the Cold War uh, in 1989. So we invite you also to explore our exhibition, which is just uh, brand new. We've set it up this afternoon. So thanks for, for coming to discuss this important subject. As a matter of fact, um, we see an increase used by states of restrictive detention regimes, in particular of solitary confinement. So this evening our speak speakers will examine how state authorities around the world have increasingly turned to restrictive detention regimes, such as solitary confinement, to manage high security detainees. The panel discussion will focus mostly on the humanitarian consequences of this form of detention and look at the measures that should be put in place in order to mitigate the negative impact and also in light of the prohibition of ill treatment. So that's what we are going to discuss. Our panelists will discuss this issue from different perspectives, from the perspective of the penitentiary, penitentiary authorities, the detainee, but also academic research in the field of criminology. We decided to start this exhibition with a documentary which is called Our Voices Are Rarely Heard by the filmmaker Kali Bondad and reporter Gabriel Cannon. So the film offers a snapshot at how inmates survive solitary confinement. So we'll find more information on this film on the webpage of tonight's event. After the discussion, we also invite you to join us at a cocktail reception above at the ICRC restaurant. There you will find a table where our colleagues Andreas and Melanie uh, will help those who are interested to virtually experience solitary confinement. So in order to do so, we invite you to download the application which has been made by the newspaper The Guardian. And you will find the link here at the back of your page. So if you are interested, they will help you have uh, this 3D uh, virtual experience after our event. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to our host this evening, Catherine Demont, who will moderate the discussion. Thank you. I am really pleased to, to open this very challenging discussion on a topic that is really not an easy one, how to preserve humanity in high security settings. You have seen a form of high security setting, it's just one among many others, um, so we don't want to focus on one in particular, but it's really to give an atmosphere of what you can feel, what you can uh, resent when being alone uh, in a very, very restrictive setting. As you may know, the International Committee of the Red Cross is visiting thousands of detainees in the world in more than 95 countries. And in the course of our detention visit, we regularly meet with detainees who are held in very close confinement. And this special confinement can take different forms, have different names, but really a common feature of all of them is that the contacts that this person can have with other human beings are highly restricted and tightly controlled and sometimes they have no contact at all with uh, other human beings. It may be because they are considered dangerous, it may be to facilitate interrogation for punishment, as a consequence of their sentence, or sometimes it is even for their own safety. But whatever the reason, such an isolation can entail enormous suffering and have very severe humanitarian consequences. We all know that human beings are social animals. 
we need company, we need to communicate with other people, we need the possibility to have meaningful relations. We need to feel that even if we are detained, we still belong to human society. So it is clearly not enough to only satisfy our physiological functions. We also need to be able to use our senses, to be intellectually and affectively stimulated. We all need also to believe that we have a future and we need hope. Detainees held in solitary confinement are deprived of most of that, sometimes for very long periods. It may amount to ill treatment and even, in some cases, to torture. And this is why we have decided to hold this conference on this topic to mark June 26, the International Day for Victims of Torture. Because indeed, torture is not only inflicted in this world by cruel perpetrators working for barbaric authorities. It does not only consist of blows and mutilation brutally inflicted on the body. There is also a sanitized form of torture, hurting and driving people mad to simply absence. Solitary confinement has this effect, especially when it is prolonged. And the problem, the increasing problem is that it is happening, that sort of setting somehow, in more and more countries, in, more, in a more and more routine way, as more and more prisons administration integrate features, such as those we have seen uh, in the film or on, on the photo, uh, within the prison design, management and systems. And this begs very important questions. Is this treatment part of the solution to manage difficult or high-risk detainees? Or is it part of the problem? By aggravating antisocial behavior that may have existed at the start and further destroying feelings of humanity and human dignity. What are the limits beyond which segregation becomes ill-treatment and should just be prohibited? Are there less, less damaging alternatives and how can they be delivered and promoted? It is what we would like to discuss today with our three panelists. And I would like first to warm, warmly thank them for uh, having accepted our invitation tonight. Sharon Shalef and Terry Wade coming from the UK, Tom Enger coming from Norway. We are very impatient to hear you as each of you will bring a different perspective to the, to the debate. I will start by giving the floor to uh, Sharon Shalef, who is an internationally recognized expert on solitary confinement. She has researched for more than 20 years the use and effects of solitary confinement and relentlessly advocated for human rights and professional standards on the issue. And Sharon, I have also, I take that opportunity to tell you that Sharon publications are a reference for ICRC teams and that it is always a pleasure to listen to you. Please. Oh, thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you all for coming. Um, the testimonies we just heard from people who were held in solitary confinement are a very powerful reminder of how profound its effects can be. And these effects are not always obvious. To quote a former ICRC colleague, Hernan Reyes, the worst scars are in the mind. And all too often, we don't hear these personal stories. Solitary confinement units are at the deep and far end of prison systems, furthest removed, not just from wider society, but also from the prison society, and largely hidden from scrutiny. Over the years, I visited many solitary confinement units in a good number of jurisdictions, most recently in the context of a major study of prison segregation or solitary confinement in England and Wales, which I undertook with the Prison Reform Trust, an NGO based in the UK. I also visited Pelican Bay Shoe, which featured in the clip we show. I found solitary confinement units typically housed a combination of people with multiple and multiple, sorry, issues and needs, some of whom were at risk to themselves, some who were at risk to others, and some people who fell into both categories. This makes solitary units hugely complex places, where some of the prison's most challenging individuals are confined alongside some of its most vulnerable people within a small enclosed space. In the course of the next 
uh, 14 minutes or so. When I'm asked to speak for 15 minutes, I try and do as I'm asked. I'll try and unpick some of that complexity and give you a flavor of how, when, and why solitary confinement is used and how it measures up to international human rights standards, in particular, the recently revised Mandela rules. But first, a definition of what constitutes solitary confinement or segregation, isolation, 23-7 regime. There are many names for this practice. The recent revision of the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, now known as the Mandela rules, provides us for the first time ever in international human rights law, a definition of solitary confinement. Rule 44 of the Mandela rules defines solitary as the confinement of prisoners for 22 hours or more a day without meaningful human contact. Now, I've got some issues with this definition and perhaps this is something we can discuss later. But in essence, as the Mandela rules make very clear, solitary confinement is what the term implies. One person confined to a cell where they will eat, sleep, and spend the majority of each and every day alone. But if the fundamentals are straightforward, the reality is much more complex. Solitary confinement is used in a number of very different ways for very different reasons. And the conditions in which people are held, both the material circumstances and the quality of the regime and human contact vary hugely. Let me try and unpick this a little. So the testimonies we heard earlier on were all from prisoners held in a super maximum security or supermax prison in the US. Now, the US supermax prison represents, at least in Western democracies, the most extreme manifestation of the use of solitary confinement for the long-term management, and by long-term I mean years and decades, of prisoners who are deemed to be dangerous or disruptive. These are purposely built isolation prisons, which means they were designed by architects to fulfill this particular purpose of long-term isolation. Um, allegedly to house the most dangerous, violent prisoners in the system, but the sheer number of people housed in long-term isolation in US supermaxes, approximately 25,000 in last count, gives light to the notion that these are all super predators, as some would have us believe. In England and Wales, by contrast, currently we have 52 prisoners who are classified as the most high risk in the system, and of these 52, only six to eight individuals are held in long-term solitary confinement, though I have to say in very different conditions to those in a supermax. Now, if some prisoners are isolated because prison authorities deem that they are too dangerous or high risk to mix with others, some are isolated because it's deemed too dangerous for them to be in the, de in the, in the general population. Prisoners who are isolated for their own protection might typically include serial sex offenders, former police or prison officers, or very high profile prisoners. And then you have what is perhaps the most common and arguably the most regulated form of solitary confinement. Namely, it's used as short but sharp punishment for prisoners who break prison rules. But even across Europe alone, the length of time that people can be isolated for this purpose really does vary a lot. Less universal, but not uncommon, is the use of longer terms of solitary confinement with pretrial detainees. This is, of course, particularly problematic because it inflicts pain on people who must be assumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. And it potentially also affects detainees' ability to defend themselves in court. Solitary confinement can also and is also used as a coercive interrogation technique, the rationale being to disorientate detainees and starve them from human contact. And in other detention settings, including police stations, military prisons, and mental health institutions. I recently discovered that it is also used in schools with pupils, some as young as nine. In prisons, one would often find prisons, prisoners belonging to certain groups or categories in solitary confinement, in practice, if not explicitly, because they embody some deep contemporary societal fear, most obviously nowadays with regards to fundamentalist Islamic terrorism and fears of radicalization of other prisoners. So I hope this gives you a bit of context of how and when solitary is used. But how does that measure up against what international law says? It is clear that solitary confinement is of such severe nature that its use may constitute under certain conditions and for certain individuals a form of torture, which is absolutely prohibited. But what about more routine users? Paragraph 45 of the Mandela Rules states that 
solitary confinement shall be used only in exceptional cases as a last resort for as short a time as possible and subject to independent review and only pursuant to the authorization by a competent authority. So Rule 45 necessarily affords some operational discretion to prison authorities to define what, for example, are exceptional circumstances or as short a time as possible. But it also articulates some fundamentally important principle about the use of solitary confinement. The Mandela rules accept, and I don't disagree, that the use of solitary confinement may have a legitimate place in the menu of options available to the management of prisoners. There may be circumstances where short-term solitary is an appropriate measure which facilitates a period of cooling off or reflection. One of the interesting findings of our England and Wales study was that the proportion of prisoners in solitary confinement we interviewed who had engineered their way, meaning they intentionally made their way into solitary confinement, 49% of those we interviewed. Often they saw that as a way to gain something, for example, a transfer to another prison. But some also saw a short period in solitary confinement as a way to get some respite from the pressure cooker of the wings and enjoy some peace and quiet. But duration is a crucial factor here. As one English prisoner told us, it's all right for about a week, it's peaceful, but after that, it just starts messing with your head. That is recognizing the Mandela rules, which prohibit prolonged solitary confinement, defined as one lasting longer than 15 days. Note that the chap in the film was talking about decades in isolation. Now, there may also be a very small number of prisoners, maybe a handful in any one jurisdiction, who do genuinely need to be held in longer term solitary confinement for their own or for others' protection. But in such cases, strict safeguards must be in place and the ultimate aim must always to be to reintegrate them to the general prison population. But I want to leave you in no doubt that I consider, and that's what underlies the text of the Mandela rules, that solitary confinement is a very undesirable prison practice which can amount to torture. It is entirely inimical to the preservation of humanity in high security settings, which is the subject of this event. Solitary confinement assaults human dignity and it makes it hard to maintain. It is deeply damaging to prisoners' mental and physical well-being. Some people may emerge from long periods of solitary confinement remarkably unscathed, but even for them, many, or for many, fully readjusting to normal life following release is difficult, sometimes impossible. And where people with existing mental health conditions are placed in solitary confinement, the results are often predictably catastrophic. It is, to quote a seminal US court judgment, the equivalent of placing an asthmatic in a place with no air to breathe. Paragraph two of rule 45 of the Mandela rules is categorical, and I quote, the imposition of solitary confinement should be prohibited in the case of prisoners with mental and physical disabilities, as it should. So the Mandela rules recognize that it matters who is being held in solitary confinement and the length of time for which they are being held. Also fundamental to the preservation of humanity are the conditions in which individuals are held. Partially this is about material conditions. Does the cell have a window? Does it have natural light? Does it have a basin and a toilet? But in my view, even more important is the quality of human interaction between the prisoner and prison staff. The physical conditions in a US supermax are in some sense not too bad. Cells have internal sanitations, prisoners are adequately fed, but the contact between prison guards and prisoners is minimal and purely instrumental. It is solely confined to, for example, passing meals through a hatch in the cell door. After experiencing a US supermax, there is always a danger that one views practices in other jurisdictions in too favorable a light. But the single most striking finding of a recent um, UK solitary study was the quality of relationships between prisoners and prison officers there. These are places where there is interaction that goes beyond the strictly functional and necessary. Prison officers talking to prisoners as fellow human beings, having a chat, a banter. For me, that more than anything else is a key to preserving the humanity of prisoners in solitary confinement. But far too often, solitary grotesquely strips individuals of their humanity, and that's particularly the case with the most vulnerable people. Out of sight, isolated individuals are sometimes subjected to grave mistreatment. There are many, many horror or just sad stories. 
For example, the story of the life and death of Khalif Browder, who was arrested when he was 16 years old on charges of stealing a backpack. An allegation, by the way, which he strongly denied. He couldn't pay his police bill, so he was detained for three years awaiting trial, two of which he spent in solitary confinement at the notorious Rikers Island in New York, where he was beaten up, bullied, and attempted suicide several times. He was eventually released without charge, but later committed suicide at home, aged 22. Or that of Ashley Peacock, a 37-year-old New Zealander with intellectual disability and mental health issues, who has been locked up for the last five years in a de-escalation wing of a mental health institution in solitary-like regime, which allows him out only for 90 minutes a day to stabilize his mental illness. Or Ashley Smith, a young Canadian woman who had been segregated in 17 different prisons by the time she died after tying a piece of cloth around her neck while staff stood outside her cell and debated what to do. But I think maybe a more important message is that solitary confinement in itself and without any further mistreatment can seriously harm health and well-being. So what's to be done? Should we be optimistic or pessimistic about the future? In my view, we should be cautiously optimistic, but vigilant. The Mandela rules on solitary confinement aren't perfect, but they are an important international statement of intent. In the US, the solitary confinement type seems to finally be in retreat. I'm careful in saying that because things can change very quickly. Barack Obama and other leading politicians have spoken out strongly against the mass use of solitary confinement, and the courts are showing a greater readiness to at least critically examine the practice. But we must not be complacent. In some jurisdictions, for example in neighboring France and Belgium, there seems to be a move towards expanding the use of solitary, in particular uh, with suspected and convicted terrorists. And whilst Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights and its absolute prohibition on torture provides an important backstop against the worst uses of solitary, wider societal fears about terrorism and radicalization in prison present a risk to its extended use. We should resist that pressure. Solitary confinement, as one supermax prisoner told me, strips you of everything and leaves you with nothing. It is no way to preserve the humanity of individuals as we must strive to do in our prisons. Thank you. So it was really interesting to situate somehow um, the problem, the general problem, and um, the, um, the regulations, the standards that are developing now, uh, and that can be used to, uh, to address the problem. I would like now to, to give the floor to, um, to Terry Waite. Terry, you are not easy to introduce because you are such a rich personality, an impressive one. So. Um, I will not use some word, but uh, just to, to one aspect of Terry's personality is that while negotiating the release of hostages uh, during the war in Lebanon in the 80s, uh, you were yourself taken hostage and held for almost five years in solitary confinement in very tough uh, conditions. So we, we thought it would be interesting to see, to have from you your, the testimony about what it is like to be uh, held like that. How to, is it possible to describe that ordeal and then um, how to find the inner strength to resist to it, to survive it and to continue to live when it stopped? Thank you very much, Cathy. I suppose the question uh, facing many people tonight was, uh, what do you prefer, football or solitary confinement? <laughs> You've chosen solitary confinement. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> what I would like to do uh, tonight briefly is talk about two things. First of all, the uh, experience, the conditions under which I was kept. And secondly, um, how I responded to that and was able to survive a situation which might be described as a, an extreme situation um, in, in the Middle East. Uh, for many years, I have worked in conflict situations around the world. And for many years, I have been engaged in the negotiation for the release of uh, people who have been illegally detained 
and held as hostage. And part of the my style of negotiating has been to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the hostage takers. Now, if you do that, you know before you take that step that it's an extremely risky business because hostage takers, of course, are highly volatile and they can, at the drop of a hat, take you or uh, kill you. And that is a risk that one has to be prepared to take. If you're not prepared to take that risk, of course, with making what safeguards you can, then you shouldn't do that work. Uh, on the other side, of course, if things go wrong, as they could do and did do in my case, then you take responsibility for that. Um, in Lebanon, uh, things did go wrong. It's a long story and there isn't time to tell it tonight. Uh, suffice to say that the trust that I had built up with the hostage takers was breached uh, because of various political activities surrounding me with which I was not associated. But nevertheless, when trust was broken, um, I found myself uh, in a very vulnerable position. <clears throat> One of the ways in which I was taken, I was told that I could see hostages who were sick and one of whom was about to die. <clears throat> I wondered myself if that was a genuine uh, invitation. And I consulted and, of course, got three different sets of advice. Some said, don't touch it with a barge pole. Others said, you'll be all right because you've got um, uh, immunity. We've been given immunity as a representative. And three, we're not sure. I myself was pretty uncertain, very uncertain. I think when you do something for other people, um, I don't think there's anyone or very few people who are full of altruism. I think you're always doing something for yourself as well. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong in that. But when, uh, in that case, I felt if they had been told the truth and one of those hostages dies and I haven't had the courage of my conviction to visit him, then I'm going to have to live with my conscience. And that was what swayed me. So I went back and was captured. <clears throat> First of all, <clears throat> I was in an underground cell uh, I'd been taken blindfolded at night and told I was going to visit. I'd been through this type of procedure many times previously, so it wasn't new. Uh, one is blindfolded, uh, taken to a safe house, given a complete change of clothing, uh, examined to see if you're carrying any locator device planted in or on the body and then the way you wait for three or four days and after three or four days you're blindfolded taken at night and you hope you're going to get to your target many times in the past I had been this time I found myself in an underground cell the first reaction was one of anger I was angry I was angry with myself for taking such an extreme step. And I was angry with my captors for uh, breaking trust. And one has to do something about anger. Now, my way of dealing with anger in that situation was to do what I think a number of prisoners do when they're first incarcerated. I refused all food. I think the reason for that was, looking back on it, <clears throat> that 
I had been confined um, bodily, but I hadn't been imprisoned totally. There was still, I still had a measure of freedom, freedom to choose and to show that I still had a will of my own. And so I refused food. I refused food for a week. At the end of the first week, <clears throat> they said, if you don't eat now, we shall make you eat. And my anger at that point had considerably dissipated. I think anger is a normal human emotion. It can be used creatively or negatively. <clears throat> but it's rather like a cancer that enters the soul if you dwell on it, if you allow it to fester. It can do you more harm uh, than it does against those whom it's held. And so my anger gradually dissipated. I said three things to myself when I was captured. I said, no self-pity. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Many people in worse situations. No over-sentimentality. Don't look back and say, ah, if only I'd been a better husband, a better father. You can't go back and live life again. You live with yourself as you are from that point. And no, uh, no over-sentimentality, uh, no self-pity. I've forgotten the third one. But there were three points. I'll come back to me in a minute. As I say, I can't say I kept those points absolutely. But I did my best. And when I felt self-pity coming on, I just reminded myself of what I'd said in those days. It was a bit of strength. The conditions were bizarre, really. One had to keep absolutely silent in this prison beneath ground. Sometimes I was moved to be in other locations, often a bombed out building. And if it was a building above ground, metal shutters were put in front of the window so there was no natural light. I was chained by the hands and feet to the wall for 23 hours and 50 minutes a day. I had one visit to the bathroom a day, during which time, and that was just for a few moments, I had to wash my clothes, uh, shower myself if there was water, often there wasn't, and then in a few minutes and then get back into the cell for another 23 hours and 50 minutes. Uh, there were no books or papers for almost four years. No television, no radio, no communication with anybody, apart from a very cursory word with the guards. Um, and so it was rather, rather extreme situation. Um, I never saw the sky or the sun or daylight for, uh, for years. Sometimes I was in the complete dark um, for days, and that was the most disorientating period. When I would wake up in the night, think it was morning, and not be sure what time of day it was. It was very, very disorientating. Mercifully, there were not too many periods when I was, for a long period of time, in the complete dark. I had a candle and sometimes there was electric light, but that was variable. Um, what I found was it was necessary to develop a structure for the day. Um, and I couldn't do that in the dark because I didn't know where I was. <coughs> I could do it later when I was moved to a building that was near to a mosque. And that gave me the opportunity to build a structure because the call from the minaret in the morning, midday and evening gave me the, the pattern so that I could build a structure around that for myself. Uh, I was uh, 
in the first year, subject to interrogation and uh, a mild torture by being beaten on the soles of the feet with cable. After that, I couldn't walk for a week. And that was the time when they were asking me questions, thinking that I was, in fact, an agent of government and trying to extract from me information which I didn't have. I can't say, and I won't say, that all my life I've told the truth. I haven't. But on this occasion, I could tell the absolute truth. And it was then I realized, of course, what a strong ally truth is, if you have it on your side. Very strong. I had a mock execution. Um, when I was told I had five hours to live. And it was at that point that I remembered <clears throat> the writings of Carl Jung, which I'd read many years previously, a native of this country, when he said, when you're in a situation of extremity, allow your body to come to your aid, and it will. And I experienced that a number of times, but on this occasion, when I was told I had five hours to live, I lay down and I slept. It was as though my body was coming to my aid, and I was able to sleep. The execution, um, obviously, clearly, didn't take place. The cold metal was put against my forehead, and uh, after that it was left. I was told... That was the end. I was going home. They believed me. But in fact, I wasn't going home. I had to stay for another four years. In that situation, one sees one's skin go white because there's no natural light. I lost muscle tone because very little exercise one could do by being on the chain all the time. My beard, which was black, grew long and white. And I thought to myself that I'm getting old before my time. And as I saw my physical body begin to disintegrate, I wondered if I would fall apart mentally and spiritually. And I determined I had to do something about that. How to survive in this rather extreme situation. First thing to live one day at a time, not to think too far ahead, but to say, now is your life, and even in this bleak and austere surrounding, there's something to be taken from it. And the way I looked at it was this, that all my life I had traveled widely and made many journeys. Now I said, you have been given an opportunity to take an inner journey. And so take that inner journey, almost like a form of self-analysis. Um, when one does that, of course, one discovers quite reasonably that one's a complex mixture of light and dark. And one has to be aware of the fact of becoming so depressed by the dark when you discover it within that you don't fall into deep depression and somehow recognize that you're simply finding, discovering what is common to all human beings. And the goal is not to be depressed by that, but somehow to turn that inside into something creative. Um, I began to, I recognize also that it was necessary to keep myself mentally alive. And I began to write in my head. I wrote my first book uh, without pencil and paper, which I only had on two occasions for the whole five years. And so the writing started in my head, which was put down on paper when I came out of captivity. Not the exact paragraph and sentence, but the general way and the reflections that would eventually be incorporated into the volume. And by writing, by keeping myself mentally alive, was a way in which uh, I could help survive. Also, some people have said, 
what role did uh, faith play in this? Well, uh, I'm not uh, an overly religious person, although I've worked as a layman for the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, I couldn't call myself religious as such, but I have belief. And I could say in the face of my captors, you have the power to break my body and you've tried, the power to bend my mind and you've tried, but my soul is not yours to possess. And by soul, I simply meant the whole person that I am. I can't define soul. But I meant it in that context. There was a part of me you will not take because it lies in the hand of God. And that very, very admittedly simple affirmation was enough to enable me to maintain hope. And I think if in situations of extremity one can find hope somewhere, which, as we've heard in many of our penal institutions, is being taken completely away from people, foolishly, if one can find hope, then that is part of the way of surviving and going on through the experience. Well, thanks a lot for this very powerful and moving testimony. And uh, I have also to say, all, I would like to tell you all my admiration for your uh, resilience, for your strength, for the fact that you remain what, what you are, despite all that experience, even maybe stronger because of it. It's not often that it is possible for people to uh, to survive in that in that way, and also somehow you are a lesson for all of us, of us humanitarian workers to keep that motivation and and to continue even in uh, situations that are uh, often difficult. Um, thank you, thank you very much. And if there are some questions, or uh, even after, we can of course we could listen to you for uh, the hours. But I would like now to come back to, to more to state-organized solitary confinement uh, that is a part uh, of a prison sentence, of part of uh, a detention regimes. And now give the floor to, um, to Tom. Tom, you are director and head of regulations and security in the Norwegian Correctional Services which is the prison service of a democratic country faced with the daily challenge of managing high-risk detainees. And one of them, Breivik, is uh, quite famous everywhere in the world, while keeping in very high regard Norway's uh, human rights obligations and values. So this is a very difficult balance to be made between good prison order uh, security uh, and these uh, principles to keep humanity even for the worst of the worst. And we would like to, to hear you about how is it possible in practice in the real world to manage that balance and to organize it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very difficult question. Um, I'd like to say first that uh, in Norway we have a saying that um, to ski jump after Virkula is very difficult. And I feel that, uh, thank you Terry, <laughs> jumping after you is very difficult. I'd like to go through uh, the Norwegian Execution Act first as a backboard of, of, uh, of our regime. Um, and according to the Norwegian Execution Act, paragraph 17, as far as, a pra as it's practically possible, prisoners shall be allowed company during work, training, programs or other measures uh, and in leisure periods. The correctional service may decide on complete or partial exclusion from company. So we have the same rules, the set of regulations as Sharon had described. As a main rule though, um, the law prescribed that both persons in remand and persons in uh, who are serving a conviction uh, are to have company with each other. <coughs> um, in Norway we might uh, exclude persons from a uh, company or put them in solitary confinement. Uh, we use it as a restriction during remand to um, prevent, uh, in example, interference with an ongoing investigation, as Sharon 
had this example. We also use it as a disciplinary, disciplinary measure. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are uh, working on a change of law, so we not use that as a disciplinary measure anymore. But if, it, you, if we use it, we can use it up till 14 days. We also use it as a preventive measure. And if building or staff conditions necessitated, or if the incarcerated person so requires it. As a preventive measure, we, we use it uh, to prevent the prisoner from continuing to influence the prison environment in a particularly negative manner, in spite of a written warning. We also use it to prevent prisoners from injuring themselves or acting violently or threatening towards others. We also use it to uh, prevent considerable uh, material damage, to prevent criminal act and maintain peace, order and security. Exactly as Sharon has described it. Uh, it is a local level that can decide that one person may be uh, uh, excluded from company with others for a period up to 14 days. If further exclusion is regarded as necessary, the higher administrative level, the so-called regional level, may prolong this uh, exclusion period for a new period of up to 14 days. And they can continue to pro prolong it um, up till a year, unless the situation is uh, as a prisoner requ requested himself or herself. If a prisoner has been excluded from company for more than 42 days, the measure shall be reported into the superior administrative level, uh, that means the directorate. These, uh, just to say, these uh, rules do not apply for juveniles. There are certain set of rules for them. <clears throat> so what are our challenging, uh, challenges using uh, solitary confinement as a preventive measure? First of all, it is visible or, of course, invisible damages used by isolation. Uh, isolation doesn't always have a visible um, uh, face. Uh, we know that uh, solitary confinement makes the risk of suicide or bodily harm uh, higher, especially in remand. We also know that uh, this situation, of course, uh, gives limited potential for rehabilitation because it's such an artificial situation. Our two main um, challenges is when the causes that initiated these preventive measures uh, persists over time. We do not long know when the danger or the, uh, the cause will, will disappear. Typically, when the prisoner is uh, representing a permanent danger for other inmates and staff. And for us, it's important to take care of the other inmates, of course, as well. And ask ourselves, to what extent should other inmates be forced to have contact with a person that represents a potential danger to them? Um, when in solitary confinement, I think it's very important that we have um, um, mitigating measures that uh, that we can uh, put in effect, um, but it might not be sufficient according to the Mandela rules, but uh, other, uh, we have to do it anyway. One of the thir th first things that, uh, that we find important is that we have to emphasize that uh, a solitary confinement doesn't have to be a hole. It could be a, a standard cell consistent of a normal bed, um, a desk, equal to an otherwise ordinary cell. This um, is very important. And of course a cell can have secured facilities if security reasons uh, necessitate this. If it's adequately safe, we, uh, we must also constantly evaluate the prison if the prisoner may take part in some collective activities with other prisoners. There might be some 
activities that is suitable, even though it's not always secure to, to, to be take part of them. We have to establish a routine where staff in solitary confinement unit invites the persons to join activities with them and or establish, establish a specific resource team that stimulate the prisoner to take part in activities, sports, hobbies, conversation, discussions, reading and more. Uh, if it's adequately safe, we also should establish a system for visits from resource persons with no direct uh, connections with the prison. We should also constantly evaluate whether or not we could establish a possibility to work or study inside the cell or in, the, in a special unit for people that are in solitary confinement. And always emphasize the importance for extended contact with prison staff and other professionals within the prison. We have established uh, high security units in Norway uh, to widen the area in which the solitary confinement uh, is, uh, is put to place. Um, widen it from a unit, uh, from a cell to a separate unit. Um, we also establish a separate work, education or leisure facilities within this unit. Um, if a prisoner is not to have any contact with any other inmates, we establish a resource team that stimulates the prisoner to take part in activities, as I mentioned earlier. This is, of course, an economics question. Um, the team that I'm referring to is uh, responsible for four inmates and it costs about one million euros a year to, to, to maintain. And not all politicians are willing to pay that amount of money for four prisoners. If adequately safe, uh, we should also place all prisoners in the same category in one unit. If we get adequately safe, we should also establish a routine allowing these prisoners to have company with each other. But I'm not really sure if mitigating measures really will um, it will it will help. But uh, I'm not sure if it will be in accordance with the Mandela, Mandela rules as they are today. There are not many alternatives for people that represent a threat to, to other inmates or staff or uh, themselves. But medical treatment, and uh, uh, I'm not really sure if that's a good reason or a good uh, measure for those people. Thanks a lot, Tom, for this uh, very detailed um, presentation of what are the regulations somehow and uh, the instructions given to the staff in uh, in Norway. And we realize also that it can be costly, not necessarily um, easy to uphold um, high standards. But still, the problem remains, what is it really the right way to do? And uh, clearly, the avenue of alternative uh, needs to, to be explored, even in, uh, in Norway. Um, I would like now, I, I don't say that it's easy and that we can do that uh, easily, but anyway, it is really the sort of discussion that is really important to have to really be able to effectively transform the new Mandela rules or other regulations related to treatment of detainees into really into uh, practice. So thank you for coming. Thanks a lot.